Hi there, I'm Brad Rourke. I'm with the Manicky Circle Group and I'm going to talk to you today about framing issues for public deliberation. Uh, this isn't the only way to frame issues um, and it's not even necessarily the best way. It's the, the one that, that I've been using with colleagues uh, for a little while now with, um, with uh, friends and colleagues at the Kettering Foundation and National Issues Forums Institute. Um, and uh, so the, the th first thing to know about, uh, about public deliberation when um, when, when I talk to like real people about it, and not not people who happen to be practitioners, is I, I get a, a question, um, basically, huh? What are, what are you talking about? And and you know this whole field is filled with with jargon, and um, you know some of it's useful, some of it's not. Uh, it, we tend to slip into it because it's because um, it's easy. Uh, public deliberation is nothing different than making choices together about. Um, about an issue that we face together. We, we deliberate all the time. Uh, you do, I do, uh, people down the block do. Uh, we decide things. We make choices by weighing the pros and cons of what we, sh what we ought to do. Public deliberation is when we do that together, when we get together to decide uh, what it is that we're going to do about, about a thorny issue. What, what kind of issue are we talking about? Public deliberation is, is useful when um, the answer that you're seeking is not necessarily a technical answer, where it's not a matter of, of just asking the experts what to do. Um, it, but instead, it's an issue that's, that's a broad concern to the community, um, where the actual diagnosis of the problem uh, you know, is, is in dispute. We, we can't even agree necessarily on what exactly the problem is. Um, and in order to make progress, uh, a range of people are going to have to act. These are problems that turn on values, not just facts and 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 data. Um, and they're problems for which there's no no clear right answer. So if you think about it, um, you can sort of think about it sort of a, a a typical kind of problem that uh, that this is that uh, we're talking about. And these are sometimes called wicked problems, which is a scary term. But what it really means is it's it's an issue where um, the problem itself is unclear. Uh, many people will have to act, and the the answer turns on values. It turns on values. It, it's it's inherently a moral and political question. These are the perennial issues that that we face um, in uh, in our society, in societies all around uh, the the globe. How do we reduce poverty? How can we make sure that all children can learn well? Um, what do we do about our energy problems? What, what should go on the internet? How can we pay for health care? Uh, how can we reduce violence in the lives of children? Um, and how should we address the national debt? These are, these are questions that we don't find out or figure out the right answer to. We renegotiate them all the time. You know, Every few years, we renegotiate these things because we figure out what's the what's our approach to this issue now, and it might not work uh, in, in a few years because the context changes. These are wicked problems. So, when we frame wicked problems, when, when we when we frame issues, we're really talking about two things. We're talking about um, we want to name the issue. We want to want to put the issue. Uh, and phrase it in a certain way, and we want to frame the issue, which is provide um, provide options. So I'm going to go through each of those uh, because um, they're they're both equally important. Uh, so the first is naming the issue, and again, this is some jargon. So you get um, when I work with uh, with other organizations that that aren't familiar with issue framing, you get you want people want to know what what the heck are you talking about. Um, and naming an issue is really that that's that's sort of our shorthand you know public dialogue people's shorthand for figuring out what is the question that we need to answer together how should we talk about this issue and you know that sounds quite simple but the 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 truth is that most issues are simply not framed or not named in public terms they don't reflect um, how you and I would ordinarily think about it. They're framed in uh, in political terms, in, you know, inside Beltway terms. They're framed in expert 
terms, or they're framed in, um, uh, you know, in competitive terms. You know, when when there's got to be a winner and a loser to to something. An example of of a of a poorly named issue is the achievement gap, which is a an expert term that that means a certain thing, and and it, and it means something that's very important. Um, it means that, that different people learn, um, have different learning outcomes based um, in, on demographics uh, and where they live and where they were born and, and, and a whole range of factors that, that ought not to have anything to do with what their learning outcomes are. Uh, so some folks do better and some folks do more, um, are more challenged and that inequity is, um, is at issue for, for a number of people. But achievement gap is not the word, not the term that most people think about uh, or would think about if they were they were um, confronted with that idea. They might come up with something instead, like you know, how do we make sure everyone is learning enough? That's what what is important. So, the name of an issue needs to, if if it's going to be something that people can deliberate with or about in a, in an effective way, it's got to um, reflect people's concerns about the issue and, and can't just be um, uh, experts preferred solutions because otherwise what you'll get when people talk about it is they will have a solution war and it'll be my solution versus your solution when what we want to do is weigh the pros and cons of the various um, of the various options so that's easy to say don't make it expert um, but how do you really do that? Well, it starts with research, and it starts with a certain kind of research. It's very important to gather data. It's very important to, to understand uh, if, if we're framing an issue. It's very important to understand um, the basics of the issue and what are the important facts. But more importantly, it starts with the kind of research that is, is very, very critical, and that is you've got to talk to people around you. Um, you start by figuring out what people's concerns are on that topic and really the only way to do this. You can't just imagine what they are. You really have to go and ask people. And you, so, you know, you go out and uh, if we're framing an issue in a community, we, we, we go, we, we encourage people to go to, you know, their friends, people in the grocery store line, bring people together for a coffee, um, talk to other organizations, talk to leaders, and you really ask some very simple questions um, that are really just designed to get people to tell you what is bothering them when it comes to that issue. So what do you think about this issue? What bothers you personally? I mean, it's very, you, you're just very direct. But you don't ask, how should we frame this issue? We don't ask, what do you think about this issue? You specifically say, what are your concerns about this issue? And that's important because, remember, this is a wicked problem that we want to, to frame for deliberation because uh, that's where, where this sort of thing works. And these are issues, these are problems that uh, turn on values people's deeply held sense of what they value. So you're darn tootin' that things are going to concern them when it comes to this issue. Otherwise, you don't have an issue to talk about. So not only does it concern them, but the second question is, what concerns do you hear from friends and family members um, when, it, when it comes to this issue? And finally, how do you think other people might feel? What would they say to these questions? How about people who are unlike you? What you want to do is you know, I do this, my colleagues do this, there's a, there's a, a steering committee or a framing team or, you know, five people. We go out and we talk to people and we, we do our best to talk to as many people and to, um, to, to ask questions in such a way that we gather in as many voices as possible. And if we can't reach different kinds of people, we try to imagine what, what they might say. And we do that enough uh, that we think we actually have a good sense of uh, of how folks respond. It's not scientific, but once once you do it enough, if you do it um, with enough people, and you go out and talk to enough people, you really can get a get a wide range. And now, once you've gathered, you get together with your your you know your core team, and you review what you heard, sharing it all, 
Uh, you write it down on big sheets of paper around the room so you can see it. You ask each other as you as you look at it. You ask each other, do we have everything? What about the people we didn't talk to? Who? What kinds of people didn't we talk to? What would they say? Do we really need to go talk to them? Um, what are the concerns that deep down we might hold that, that we're not saying? Get it all out and as you do that, as you reflect, and you see it all around you because the best way to do this is to put it on big pieces of butcher paper, um, you'll see clusters of similar concerns beginning to appear and you'll start to put these clusters together. I mean it's, you know, someone will, they may use different words but they have the same idea. Honesty and integrity uh, will, would be one that might come together uh, very easily. And you do this uh, and you end up probably with um, you know between seven and ten you know that's sort of an easy place to get to with, with a bunch of clusters and you do this by you know asking pushing on what's the you know what's behind each of these uh, concerns and you do this for all of them make sure you've really captured everything and but then now comes the hard part you've got to drive to three or four and there's no magic to three or four. It's not like those are the only options that are ever available. Um, but it turns out that in deliberating there are mechanical reasons um, and logistical reasons and practical reasons for there to be no more than three or four main options on the table. It's, it's, all, it's really all you have time to talk through and it's really all that, um, that you can go through without sacrificing clarity. I mean, just imagine how exhausting, you know, going through eight different, you know, major pro and con exercises would be. So you, you push to for three or four sort of main clusters. And to go from, you know, eight to ten to three or four, you start to ask yourself, you know, are these eight, you know, really different from one another? How can we continue to combine them? You know, what is it that might bring them together? When you end up with three or four, what you want to do is uh, make them alive. So uh, it's one thing to have, you know, sort of a uh, honesty cluster on, you know, on butcher paper that you've drawn a big circle around or something, and that's one thing. But what you want to do is write a couple of sentences that really describe what is the concern that's that what it, that's behind all of these concerns, and what does it imply about uh, how the problem ought to be addressed? It takes some wordsmithing. Um, and once you've done that, you check back. You went out to people and you talked about a particular topic. You know, you said, I want to know uh, what concerns you when it comes to, um, to freedom in the internet for instance, which we're going to look at in just a moment. Um, and you look at the clusters that you've come up with, and it may well be, it usually is, in fact, that they're actually answering a different question. So you, um, so you try to figure out what's the question that these are answering. So here's an example. We, you know, with uh, the National Issues Forums, uh, we framed an issue on um, on the internet. It started out as First Amendment in the internet, and um, that wasn't exactly uh, where we ended up because that wasn't necessarily the the exact thing that people, when you got down to it, people wanted to talk about. Um, the issue guide looks like this. It's available at nifi.org. Um, the overall issue that people were interested in is is a little broader. It's what should go on the internet. It relates to freedom of speech or First Amendment, but it's not the same. First cluster of concerns has to do with privacy um, and, and me being able to keep my information private, that the Internet makes me live in a fishbowl and that we need to safeguard personal information. The second cluster of concerns has to do with, um, with ensuring that we maintain the freedom that the internet allows. There's, there's amazing things that are possible with the internet. And there are also forces that are 
removing that freedom. Uh, so we need to protect that. Third cluster of concerns has to do with, with safety. So it has to do with the, the idea that there are things that go on on the internet that, that we really um, need to question whether we can or should allow them to go on. Uh, and what we need to focus on is protecting um, ourselves and society from the things that, that, that happen on the internet. So that's naming the issue. Now uh, framing an issue. Again, uh, framing is a piece of jargon that elicits a predictable response. Um, and what it really means is to figure out and articulate the main options to address the problem along with some actions uh, that would go along with that option. An option is like the main direction. Um, and what are the drawbacks? The, the nature of public deliberation is that what we're doing is facing trade-offs. We're facing the drawbacks of our favored solutions. And we're going to find that each of the main clusters are filled with tension, if we've done our job right. That, that there are things that, that, you would, that you might do if, uh, you know, if a particular concern were driving you. For instance, if thinking about the internet, if that first concern were driving me, um, that is privacy, I might say that, well, you know what, there ought to be a law that uh, commercial entities cannot keep a dossier on any individual. Now that's that's obviously something that that is responsive to the concern about privacy, but it has a drawback. And the, na the, the job of public deliberation, the job that we have to do together when we get together to deliberate, is to face the trade-offs and decide which ones we're willing to accept and which ones we're not. So for instance, a drawback of, um, of disallowing any dossiers is that it would be almost impossible for me to, um, to do any online shopping because I'd have to recreate uh, you know, my transaction information each time. Um, some people may say that that is a, a, a reasonable trade-off and others may say I don't want to make that trade-off and that's the conversation we need to have. So what we're doing is um, building a tool for people to use in a group that makes these downsides clear so we can we can consider them and what you do is you start with the clusters that you that you wrote out the two sentences and what you want to do is come up with a series of actions that would go along with that you know so um, it, it's really uh, simple but you need to follow some some rigor and discipline and make sure that when you come up with when we come up with what people should do it's not just they but that there's actually someone who would do that action and that there be a um, that there be a range of actors because what we're talking about is an issue again it's a wicked problem that that we're hoping to deliberate on which means that many people from many walks of life have to act so you just ask if that's your concern what would you do to address that? If privacy is your concern, what would you do? And you come up with a, um, a series of actions. It sounds easy, but it takes a little time. But you come up with a series of actions that, um, that are responsive to that. And each one should have a drawback. Otherwise, we would have done it by now. So if we did that and it worked perfectly, what would the consequences be? What would we have to accept? It's important that um, these drawbacks aren't just arguments against doing the thing, doing the action, but they're instead the, the costs of doing it. So just to say oh, it's too expensive, we can't do it, or we'd have to raise taxes so we're not going to do it, or it just wouldn't be possible. Those aren't good. Uh, what you want is an intrinsic drawback drawback that's intrinsic to the action and that that can be hard this is one of the hardest parts but when you're done again I made it sound easy is you should be able to lay it all out in a grid and uh, the National Issues Forums have just released uh, an issue guide on the national debt 
that, uh, that we framed up. Um, it looks like this. It's available at nifi.org. And as you can see, it's, um, it says, what should we do about the national debt? That's how the problem is named. It's not how should we balance the budget. It's not what should we cut, because actually the options are, are different. It's what should we do? What should we do about the national debt? And you can lay it out in a grid with uh, options, uh, actions, and drawbacks for each for each option. And the first option has to do with um, we need to agree to make sacrifices now. What we should do about the national debt is agree to have all people feel some pain. We need to compromise on our differences. Um, it's time to face the problem. We need to raise taxes and cut spending. Neither alone will get the job done. And if we if we uh, agree with this option, there's a range of things we would do. Uh, we'd raise the retirement age for Social Security. We'd probably cut some Medicare. We'd raise tax rates across the board. We might reduce or eliminate tax rates, tax breaks. We'd reduce defense spending. We'd make some hard budgetary choices. And these would all have uh, consequences and drawbacks uh, that um, that some people may find too much to bear. Others may say that's that's a fine consequence, and uh, and that's what we do when we deliberate, as we think about um, about how we respond to those trade-offs. The second option is different from the first. The first said, "Let's balance. Let's balance the budget." The second says, "You know what? We keep getting in this problem." we need to figure out a way to not get into this problem again. We can't just hope that people are going to have discipline. and We can't just hope that there will be fiscal responsibility. We actually need to put in place uh, mechanisms to keep us from getting into this problem again. So what we might do if that's how we want to respond to the national debt is we might create a ba uh, pass a balanced budget amendment. Reinstate uh, pay-as-you-go, which is a way of, of creating budgets where no new program can exist unless it's balanced by budget cuts or revenue. Um, require a sunset date for, for all new programs so that you know it, they expire in five years. And here again there are, there are important drawbacks that are um, that even if that action worked we would have to put up with. And some will uh, will say these are okay and some will, will say that I, I'm not interested. The third option says we actually need to worry about growing the economy because if we grow the economy, if we make the pie larger, we can then handle the national debt much more effectively. And in fact, if we don't focus on growing the economy now, we're gonna, um, we're gonna engage in cost cutting uh, and we're going to harm the economy, just as it's trying to recover. And if this is our option that we agree with, there'd be a range of things we would do: we'd stimulus, we'd reduce, we'd reduce tax rate, we would. Um, and note that these are two things that the the left approves of and the right approve of, and they're actually in the same option. That that that's actually the mark of a of a good issue framing is when the polarized debate. Um, begins to come together. And again, each action has a trade-off. So there you have it again, nifi.org is where you can get this, um, this issue guide and it's going to be used all throughout the nation for the rest of this year, 2011, and into next year, 2012. Um, just with the, the few moments I have left, uh, I want to go through um, a few characteristics of an effective framing. Once you've done this work, ways to check, um, ways to make sure that uh, it's working and the kinds of things you can expect from, from a good framing. And one is that um, values need to be reflected in the options. They can't just be strategic things that, um, that, that are just clever solutions. Um, and the actions have to follow logically from the, from the values expressed in the concerns. Remember, the, um, in the internet issue, the actions have to reflect the concern about privacy in that first option. Uh, the tensions between advantages and disadvantages have to be clear because again we're making it possible for people to face them. Uh, 
does not lend, um, they don't lend themselves to an all of the above response. Let's just do all three. Um, consequences aren't just pragmatic ones, but they are uh, drawbacks that are intrinsic to the, uh, uh, to the action. Uh, has a range of actors, including citizens, and what they have to do. That way the people in the room, everyone in the room, has, has a role. Um, but also recognizes a range of other actors. Um, critical that a good framing recognizes and makes room for unpopular points of view so that people feel welcome uh, and can actually engage in deliberation. Uh, each option has to be presented in the best foot forward and when you're framing often there's an option you disagree with vehemently and the task in creating an issue guide is to make sure that that option is expressed just as firmly uh, and forcefully as the others but also the negative consequences of each are just as fair. Um, and a good framing will disrupt the patterns that, that we see in public life today, that you know the, the red versus blue, right versus left, conservative versus liberal, that those actually won't get replicated necessarily in, in, in the framing if you've done your job, which is notice in the national debt issue, we actually put revenue raise, you know, raise revenue and cut entitlements in the same option because they're really two sides of the same coin even though the left and the right are arguing over, over that very thing. You've got to start where people are, which is the entire naming uh, segment of this, uh, of this exercise. Um, and the most important thing is that uh, at the end of a deliberation, often people are stewing. Uh, they don't necessarily come to a conclusion that they're happy with because they're uh, looking at the downsides of the things that they hold dear. And that's can be difficult, but it also can be very eye-opening and it can draw communities together and make them much more resilient uh, and much more able to respond to the issues that they deliberate over and others. So there you have it. Um, thanks for listening. I hope, uh, I hope this was helpful. And um, if you have any questions, I'd encourage you to get in touch with me. Um, Again, I'm Brad Rourke at the Manakee Circle Group, uh, and um, this has been Framing Issues for Public Deliberation. If you want to get in touch with me, uh, the best way to do that is to go to my website. Thanks for listening, and uh, be well.